Good morning, everyone. Uh, as you know, we are now, as we work through the book of Acts, we are in chapter 20. So we're just going to kind of continue our, our verse by verse going through it, looking at each verse and just a, just because I think this is a great way to really learn the Bible, where you're actually going through, not just taking a verse here and a verse there, or this book and that, but going through a book all the way through it, verse by verse. All right, so verse 1. When the uproar had ended, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraged them, said goodbye and set out from Macedonia. Okay, so if you remember back in chapter 19, how 19 ended, uh, there was a riot. This seems to happen a lot to Paul. Uh, he goes into a town ministry, and eventually there's such a pushback and so much um, attack against him that his life is actually in danger. So the disciples say, it, it's time to get out of Dodge. It's time to, to leave because your life is in danger. Uh, and it's interesting that, that in Ephesus, he was actually there three years. So that's the longest he was uh, at any one city or any one church. And when I say church, uh, like in Ephesus, the church was made up of, of, of many different congregations. Uh, they would sometimes meet in large you know, venues, and then a lot of times it was house to house house churches or home groups, if you want to call them. And so it was made up of different congregations. But so he has to basically flee again, has been kind of the pattern. He stays till he gets run out of town, basically. Threat, threats come against him. So he's leaving uh, for Ephesus, which is again in Turkey, and he's going towards Macedonia. He's going west again. So in verse 2, says he traveled through the area, speaking many words of encouragement to the people, and he finally arrived in Greece. So this was his kind of pattern. As he had traveled, he'd go back through those churches that he had established on the first and second missionary trip, and he would check on them. He would, you know, bless them, try to encourage them, deal with certain problems that usually have come up. So this was his normal pattern going back again, and, and he just didn't leave them. In other words, he didn't establish a church and just leave. He would go back, see how they're doing, check on them, strengthen them. So verse C, where he stayed, so he stayed in Greece for three months. And because the Jews made a plot against him, just as he was about to sail for Syria, he decided to go back through Macedonia. So there was a plot, and what the plot was, and you had to do actually some research to find this out, but the plot was once he got aboard the ship, they were going to throw him overboard. Kind of like a Jonah situation, except hopefully there wasn't a, a whale to swallow him. So that was a plot. So he decided instead, in verse 4, to go back to Macedonia. But in verse 4, I want you to look at, there's several different names here. And the important part is really not the names, it's where they're from. Okay? So it says from Berea. Remember, we're to be as the Bereans, you know, to check scriptures, see if it's true. That was one of the cities he established. Thessalonica was another one he, he mentions here. Derby. Derby and Lystra was where uh, he was actually stoned to death. And Timothy uh, in, was from Asia, in other words, from Ephesus and that region. Well, the reason that's important as far as listing where, where these men are from is because the purpose, remember, and it doesn't say so much in Acts as it is in other places, Paul, remember when he was sent out from Antioch, he was told... Um, to take up an offering for the saints back in Judea. 
Because what had happened was, and Agabus had prophesied this, there'd be a, a famine that would come, uh, and the, the church there and the, the Christians there were in, uh, were in trouble financially. And so he had sent out to all these different cities, Derbe and, and Philippi, all these cities they had been to, to make collections. And that's why in, in the letters to like the Thessalonians and the Corinthians, he tells them, you know, the first day of the week, to take up an offering, set money aside, so that when I come, I can gather this, and we're going to take it to Jerusalem. And so these men were from all these different cities, and their purpose was uh, the church would kind of assign them, okay, you take our offering uh, to assure that it was actually being used right, and Paul wanted to make sure that there's no, uh, nothing underhanded going on with this offering that they're collecting. So they're actually traveling with him. They're going to go to Judea to make sure that the offering is given to them, and this is from their, their different churches. So that's why you have the names of these different uh, areas that he had been to. So we'll take verse 5 and 6. Now see, these men went on ahead and waited for us at Troas. But we sailed from Philippi, and after the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and five days later, we joined the others at Troas, where we stayed seven days. So they're traveling. Now they're going back east to Troas. Troas is in, at that time, called Asia, which is, again, is present-day Turkey. So they've gone west. Now they're going back east. And then verse 7, it says, On the first day of the week, we came to break bread. And Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, he kept on talking until midnight. But it's interesting, it says, first day of the week. So this is one of the first times we have actually stating for sure that they're meeting on Sunday. Now, this can be an issue because a lot of times earlier when Paul would go in the synagogue, of course, he would go on the Sabbath on Saturday because that was when they, the, Sabbath, or the synagogue met. But in this case, they're breaking bread. When they're talking about breaking bread, it is actually uh, taking communion or the Lord's Supper. You know, they didn't have a little cup and a little piece of cracker like we do. They actually had a meal together. And so uh, that was their service, and they would have communion each time they'd get together. And sometimes you will have people say, well, actually, you should be doing that on the Sabbath on Saturday. Um, because they would say, and this is, and you may run into this, and what they will say would be that, well, this all changed when Constantine came to power as a, you know, he was converted as a, a, a Roman Empire, and that that's when it changed from Saturday to Sunday. But we know that's really not true because it happened here, but it also happened Tertullian, who was one of the early church fathers, who was way before uh, Constantine, had wrote, had written the Christians and said that they should have communion and have their services on uh, the first day of the week, on Sunday recognizing the resurrection of the, of the living Christ. So that may come up sometimes. So just so you kind of know that, uh, I'll give you one. And this is the only scripture I'm going to go to outside of this. is, is second, or not second, but uh, Colossians chapter 2, and verse 16 and 17. And it says, Therefore do not, anyone, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat, or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon, a celebration, or a Sabbath. These are shadows of things that to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Now, there's another scripture in Romans 14, verses 5 and 6, which basically says, I'll paraphrase it, that one, one person believes this day is sacred, another person believes this day is sacred. What you need to do 
if, if you're truly convicted of that is the right day to, to worship, then you need to do that. Okay? And others think that every day is just a luck. So anyway, just in case you, you run into that. All right, verses 8 and 9. So Paul's been speaking to midnight already, okay? Verse 8 and 9 says, There were many lamps in the upstairs room where they were meeting. So this is a big venue. They're on the third floor, by the way. It's seated in a window was a young man named Eutychus who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. I don't want to hear any complaints out there. <clears throat> now, when he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story, and he was picked up dead. Let that be a warning to everyone in here. <laughs> Do not get drowsy. Now, it's interesting because uh, when the phrase young man in Greek is peis, P-E-I-S, which means a young man between 8 and 14 years old. So he's sitting in the window, getting drowsy, as you can imagine, all, I mean, practice speaking all night, falls out from the third floor, and it says it killed him. He's dead, okay? In verse 10, Paul went down, and he threw himself on the young man, and he put his arms around him. Don't be alarmed, he said. He is alive. Now, there's a reason uh, that Luke is telegraphing something here. Okay, Luke, again, the author of Acts. Because, you know, Paul always said, I was like an apostle, but untimely born. In other words, he had wished that he was living and being one of the 12 disciples. Okay, but he was untimely born. So what Luke is showing is that, hey, he's doing the same thing that Peter did uh, in Acts chapter 9 when he raised Dorcas from the dead. He's doing the same thing that Elijah and Elisha did, and he's doing almost the same thing where he laid on the child Elijah and raised him from the dead. So it's, it's showing, as people read through Acts, the reader would realize that he's on the same level as the 12 apostles, on the same level as Elijah and Elisha. Even though he was born later and didn't actually walk with the Lord when the Lord was, was alive. So he picks him up after he, again, had been dead. Look, 11 and 12. Then he went upstairs again and broke bread and ate. And after talking until daylight, he left. The people took the young man home alive and were greatly comforted. So they had communion together, and then they were greatly comforted. But that is, again, after Paul spoke day and all night long. That's a long service. Okay, verse 13 says, We went on ahead to the ship and sailed for Asos, where we were going to take Paul aboard. He had made this arrangement because he was going there on foot. So what's going on there? So he sends everybody else. They take the easy way. They, they sail. And Paul goes by himself on foot. So I kind of think, you know, why, why would Paul do that? You think of Paul. Paul is, he's almost on 24-7. He's around people all the time. 
He's ministering to people. People are questioning him. He's dealing with issues all the time. And sometimes I wonder, did he ever get peopled out? I just want to be alone. <laughs> you know, I just want some time on myself. Plus, in order to hear the Lord, you know, we talk about prayer walking. By the way, this is, is 25 miles. I don't know when the last time you guys walked 25 miles. But he had a long time to walk and pray and hear from the Lord. So that's just my kind of idea of why he chose to do this. Send the others on. Give me a little time where I can be by myself, be me and the Lord, and I can hear. And I think what he's hearing is going to be coming up here as we go on. So he had a long prayer walk. Okay, let's pick it up in verse 14, 16. When he met us at Azel's, we took him aboard and went on to Mathalene. The next day we sailed from there and arrived at Chios. The day after that, we crossed over to Samus. And on the following day, we arrived at Miltus. Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus to avoid spending time in the province of Asia. For he was in a hurry to reach Jerusalem, if possible, by the day of Pentecost. So he, does, he doesn't want to go to Ephesus, even though that was one of his main uh, church plants, because he doesn't want to spend the time, because he wants to get back to Jerusalem before Pentecost. And I have to wonder if that was not one of the things that he picked up on his 25-mile walk to meet them, receiving that word, you need to get to Jerusalem, try to get there before Pentecost. Okay, 17 through 19. For Miltus... Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. So again, he doesn't want to spend time in Ephesus, so he's having the elders. And these would be elders from uh, different congregations. You know, some of them might be large congregations, some may be home churches, but he sent for them to come to him so he wouldn't have to spend time there. And when they arrived, he said to them, you know how I lived the whole time I was with you, from the first day I came into the province of Asia. So many different congregations, different elders coming, all represented. And Paul starts kind of giving his, his, uh, his lifestyle. This is, you, you know how I ministered to you. You know how, how I treated you. You know how my, my form uh, of ministry was. Verse 20. Well, let me go back to 19. I serve the Lord with great humility and with tears, although I was severely tested by the plots of the Jews. You know that I did not hesitate to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but taught you publicly and from house to house. So in other words, he, was, he would teach them in the different congregations, whether it was a large venue or whether it was house to house. Verse 21, I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. So that was his message. You know, repent, you know, turn away from the way you're living you're to turn towards the Lord and give your heart to him and have faith in him, that belief, that faith in Jesus. Okay, verse 22. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem not knowing what will happen 
to me. So he's compelled by the Spirit. Some other uh, version, I think ESV says, he is constructed by the Holy Spirit to go to Jerusalem. And so this kind of kind of comes to a little bit of an issue in 23 because it says, I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. Okay, so this kind of, so he's compelled by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem in a hurry, I think. And again, I think even on that walk, there was this emphasis, get to Jerusalem. But in every city, as he's going back to these churches, he's being warned prophetically by people that prison and hardships, if he goes. So can you imagine what people, put yourself again in the story, you're getting a clear prophetic word. If Paul goes to Jerusalem, this is what's going to happen. So you're probably telling him, don't go. Because the Lord has, has shown us clearly that if you go, they're going to imprison you and there's going to be a lot of hardship and suffering. On the other hand, Paul is compelled and he knows by the Holy Spirit that he is to do that very thing. And so you see that, that kind of tension probably between the churches and Paul and, and trying to go, Paul, don't do this. Don't go. Because the Lord has showed us what's going to happen. You're going to be in prison. They're gonna, you're going to go through a lot of hardship, a lot of suffering if you do this. So from their point of view, Paul shouldn't be doing this. But Paul knows Despite this, that that's the very thing he's supposed to do. So you have these, these not competing world. They're both true. But from one point of view, it's like, why would you do that, Paul, when you know what's going to happen to you? So in the next verse, verse 24, Paul's basic answer is, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of te testifying to the gospel of God's grace. So he recognized this. He knew what they were saying was true. But at the same time, he knew this was what he was supposed to do. He had to finish the race. He had to complete the task that the Lord had given him. So even though it was a negative thing in the, in the standpoint that he's going to be arrested and put in prison, he's going to do a lot and be suffering quite a bit, he knows this is what he's supposed to do. This is what the Lord is calling him to do. Let's look at 25 through 27. Okay, so he's, he's speaking to, again, these elders that have come from Ephesus. And he says, Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, I declare to you today, that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. So he tells him, I know that I'm not going to see you again. I'm not going to be back here. This is the last time I'm going to see your face. Okay, then in verse 28, he's going to give them some instructions. He says, keep watch over yourself 
and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherd of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. So the first thing he tells him is keep watch first over yourself. Guard yourself. Be aware. Be watchful. You know, the enemy is like a, a, a roaring lion seeking who he can destroy, you know, destroy. And keep watch over the flock that the Lord has given you, the care, the shepherding of the people. Verse 29. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. So he knows that there's going to be false teachers who are going to come in. So he's warning them. Again, prophetically, this is what's going to happen. False teachers are going to come in, and they're going to draw people from them. In verse 30, he says, even from your own number, He's talking to these elders, talking to these people. And he's saying, even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So again, a warning. There's going to, even among some of you, there's going to be some arise who's going to distort the truth of the word and draw in the, for the purpose of drawing people to themselves. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. So for three years, he is, you know, he's, he's not only sharing the gospel, the good news, okay? of repentance and turning towards God's and the blessing and eternal life and all that goes along with that. But at the same time, he has also been faithfully warning against false teachers, warning against uh, people being deceived and what would happen. And so he's also done that for three years, warning them. So he's, he's saying, I, I am uh, innocent of all blood. In other words, things that are going to happen I've done my part. The rest is on you now because you're not going to see my face again. For three years. Okay, verse 32 to 35. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourself know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself, who said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So he's reminding them of his own example, that he was not in it for monetary gain. He was not in it uh, to get something from the people, it was laying his own life down. He says, I worked with my own hands. I was a tent maker. I supported myself. And so I'm here giving only to you. I didn't covet your silver or gold. I, you know, I had my motives were pure. And he's wanting them to follow that same, that, that same example. Then we'll go through 36 and end. 
When he had said this, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. So Paul lays out this, this warning, you know, as he again goes throughout the different churches and he, he's always strengthening, encouraging, correcting. And then he comes to this time with Ephesus who said, you know, I know I'll never see your face again. Uh, and he gives them the warning of what's going to happen to be aware there's going to be false teachers coming who will try to distort the word of God. And that's why it's so important for us, and we have this advantage that we all have the word of God. It doesn't do you any good if you don't read it, if you don't study it. And so it, that's why it's so incumbent upon us to be students of the word, to find out what the scripture says, to continue to have it built within us so that when something counterfeit does come along, you, you can recognize it immediately. Nope, that's not God. So we have an advantage in comparison to what they have. But he, so he shares the gospel, he shares the good news, but at the same time, he's warning, warning them about false teachers, about things that can happen. He tells them to wash themselves first and then to watch the flock that the Lord has given them to protect the flock as a, as a shepherd would do. It's interesting why I was doing some, some kind of research on this, this chapter. It brought to my attention, and I, I knew this before, but the comparison between what the Old Testament, what happened to you when you died, in the Old Testament, you went to Sheol, the place of the dead. And you'll find that throughout the Old Testament, and you find it a lot of times in, in the Psalms. Sometimes in the English translations will transfer it or translate it as grave, but it means Sheol. So it's like when, uh, when Saul went to, to the medium to have the medium call up Samuel, he came up from the place of Sheol, place of the dead. When, uh, so we come to the, the New Testament, and so there were, you know, the, you have Abraham's bosom too, you have that story of Lazarus and, and the, the rich man and Lazarus, and how Lazarus, he's in Sheol, but he's in the good part of Sheol, and the evil one is in what we call Hades, or the bad part of, of Sheol. But when we come to the New Testament, when Jesus is hanging on the cross, and he says to the thief, this day you will be with me in paradise. That would have been totally shocking to the Jews. Because you only have Enoch and Elijah who were transferred to heaven. Everybody else is in Sheol. And then you have Paul saying to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So those things would have been, you know, and I never thought about that much, how much that would have just blown the mind of the Jewish believer at that time. What? We die and we go immediately into the presence of the Lord? Talk about good news. That's great news. But all through this passage, as we go through the book of Acts, we see the, you know, the beginning of the church and, and, and how evangelism went out and how people were brought in. We see all the the, the, you know, the flashback, the, the, you know, 
we take we, we see gain, ground gain, and then you see a, a attack counterattack come, and and they're, they're they take two steps forward, sometimes one step back. But the word of the Lord is is going forth across the nations of the known world. And again, later as we get into this, we're going to find where Paul is so animate again about going to Spain because that was the farthest nation in the, in the table of nations in Deuteronomy was Spain because that was their known world. You know, they didn't know about China. So that was why he was so adamant to fulfill that call. And again, we don't know for sure if he made it, but he had that desire and he will say, I've got to get to Spain because that was the last, that was the furthest west nation of the known world of the time. And many believe he did. We can't prove that. But his heart was, and you go back to, I must, if only I may finish the race and complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given me. That was his heart. And then I think of, of two of the, out of this chapter. The confusion that m- must have been when people were getting clear prophetic words, Paul, if you go to Jerusalem, you're going to be in prison, you're going to suffer. And from their point of view, they're going, Paul, don't do that. But yet that was the Lord's will. And it probably would have been easier for Paul to go, you know, I, I kind of like that prophetic word. Maybe I won't go. But he stayed the course, knowing what was going to happen to him when he got to Jerusalem. But the good news is, he kept saying, I, I got to get to Rome. He gets to Rome. As a prisoner, but he gets to Rome. So, Hallelujah, we thank you for your work. So I, I just want to again encourage you guys. You got you have to be in the word. You need to be daily having whatever type of Bible reading plan you want. And we have one that's it's behind the information center, one I've used for years, and it goes through the, the Old Testament once and the New Testament twice within a year, and it puts it all in chrono, chronological order, especially for the Old Testament, because the Old Testament is not in chronological order. So if you have a reading in Kings that goes along with the same reading in Chronicles, they'll put them together, or if you have a psalm that goes with that. But you just need to be in the Word continually. It's like that old saying that you say, you know, the Secret Service uh, doesn't train their, uh, their agents to identify uh, false counterfeit counterfeit dollars, they they treat them to to know what a, a real dollar bill looks like. So when they see the false, they know it. And it's the same kind of principle with the Word of God. That if you are in it, if you're reading it, if it's in your heart, you grow in it, then you're going to be able to identify something that's not right. So Lord, we just thank you again, for your word, and and Lord, we treasure it. And Lord, we don't want to be those who are complacent, those who, Lord, have been given so much, and yet, Lord, we don't take advantage of it. Lord, give us a deep hunger for your word. Lord, that we would study it, that we would continue to grow, that we be teachable, always learning, Lord, finding something new, seeing things we haven't seen before, Lord, that you just cause us to grow and flourish with your word. We thank you, Lord, for the examples that we have. Lord, we we thank you for the example of Paul, Lord, who truly laid down his life for you, for the word, for the gospel. Lord, give us that heart, Lord. And Lord, that we would see things from an eternity eternity viewpoint. Lord, it's so easy for us to be caught up just in the world and the things that are happening and and realize, Lord, that we are but a vapor. 
We are like a, a flower, the Bible says, that, that flourishes and then the sun comes out and it fades so quickly. This life goes so fast, Lord. So, Lord, teach us to number our days. And, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your faithfulness. In the name of Jesus, amen.